Irish Academy of Music is one of Europe's oldest and most distinguished conservatoires. There's a very long tradition in the Academy. I mean, it goes back for over 100 years and it was set up as quite a small uh, institution, but an institution really dedicated to very high levels. We're located in Dublin City, which is the capital of Ireland, and we cater for bachelor's, master's and doctorate students in music performance, particularly classical music performance. The amount of people that we take onto the course is very important. We, we take very few people, it's very competitive, but it's, it's done in such a way that we can ensure that uh, not only do we have top quality people, but there are reasonable employment prospects. We would rarely have over 100 students at senior level, and there's a reason for this. We believe as an institution that we will do best for our students by giving them a lot of tuition time. They will usually get two hours of lessons with an international calibre teacher. We give them a lot of opportunities to perform in Ireland's best national venues. We give them an opportunity to engage in our extensive international touring programme, so they will appear in venues like Carnegie Hall or the Metropolitan Club in New York. And we also give them opportunities to engage in mentoring programmes with our national orchestras. The other thing I think is very important about the Academy, it's, it's a real hub and nexus of performance. Our institution might be 160 years old, but the passion and the ambition we have for our students to achieve their best is absolutely timeless. I look forward to receiving your application. Good afternoon. My name is Colma Brisco, and I am the head of the keyboard faculty at the Royal Irish Academy of Music. My job is to support, direct and guide students through various degrees and courses and to guide the students through their musical journey at the Academy. We have a small cohort of keyboard faculty students. We all receive individual attention. This is a strong faculty, steered by a very strong staff of professional teachers and performers. In both bachelor and master's degree, there are several exams. We have a mid-year exam in December, concerto in February, chamber music as part of the Chamber Music Dublin Fest in April, and the end of year recital in June. Before COVID-19, we had many events in the academy with many performing opportunities for our students. We had some virtual events since the lockdown in March. The faculty have performance class each week. This is an opportunity to support your peers and give some feedback and to perform yourself while you're at the course. We have professional spotlight week five times a year, an opportunity to engage in exciting projects. Learn skills and responsibility for vigorous performance related deadlines effectively will be reflected in performance exams and weekly lessons. The Royal Irish Academy of Music is one of the oldest conservatoires in Europe. The keyboard faculty is enriched in history. Very prominent teachers and pianists have taught at the Royal Irish Academy of Music. We are here in the Georgian houses of Westland Row. We offer tuition from the age of six and you may leave the academy 20 years later with a doctorate degree in performance. The Academy is an associated college of the University of Dublin Trinity College. Today you will meet the staff, members of the RIAM family, alumni and current students. For all of our third level courses, you must apply online by the December the 1st. You may fill an application form Provide a repertoire list of previously performed works. Provide a detailed CV, including performances, 
examinations and courses taken to date. If you apply for the master's degree, you must submit a transcript of the BA in music degree or something equivalent. You must submit written recommendation from two musicians and one of those may include your own music teacher. You have to give a personal statement indicating why you wish to study a performance degree at the academy. You will be auditioned and interviewed by a panel, including the head of faculty. You might ask, are there any one-year courses in the academy? We have three. We have the access course, we have the DIPMOS course, and we have the recital artist diploma. If you wish to spend a year working on practical and academic areas in preparation for a third level course, this is the right course for you, the access course. The DIPMOS course is a qualification. It's a DIPMOS in teaching and performance. This is an opportunity to spend a year studying and performing and practicing intensively. The Recital Artist Diploma is a program for postgraduate students aiming at performance and who want to prepare for recitals. You might wonder, are there any other courses in the Academy? We have the BMOS Ed, the BMOS in Performance, the MMOS and the doctorate degree in performance. The BMOS Ed is a professional qualification for those wishing to become music teachers at second level. And that includes schools in Northern Ireland. The BMOS in performance is aimed at those who wish to pursue a career in music performance. You might ask, what are the benefits of studying a BMOS performance degree at the Academy. You will receive 30 individual practical lessons, one-to-one -one tuition, the highest number of contact hours with any teacher of any program in Europe. Are there performing opportunities? Yes, we give performing opportunities in solo and in chamber music. We have several competitions and bursaries too. We have exciting competitions where you have the opportunity to compete, achieve at a high level, and have a recognition which will open doors for you in the future. What are the other opportunities at the Academy? We frequently organize masterclasses from international artists and we have contact with many internationally acclaimed musicians, both here in Ireland and abroad. You might wonder, are there any academic studies? Yes, we have academic studies in small classes to help you to excel in academic studies. Our master's degree is a postgraduate degree. This course, is for exceptionally talented performers who already have a solid undergraduate training. You will expand your performing skills and in the MMOS program, you will play solo, chamber music recitals. You will learn how to perform. You will learn performing skills and also improve your technique. You will gain experience on a concert platform. Our doctorate degree program will provide a qualification of prestige and excellence in music performance and research. Teachers will prepare you for solo recitals. They will prepare you for international competitions and you have the opportunity to join established chamber music groups. A performing musician requires skills which supports more than their technical and artistic training in order to achieve successful career in music. Good physical health 
is addressed through yoga. Mental fitness is developed through performance psychology, business and leadership skills. These are developed through career strategy and the ability to think as a musician is explored through improvisation. The modules for all courses include your principal study, chamber music, performance electives. The performance electives include accompaniment, related instrument, conducting, historic performance, and it is compulsory for all keyboard students to sing in chorale. The RIM is uniquely positioned in Ireland to provide teaching at this level with the staff of international caliber in the areas of research and performance. As a national conservatoire, we take pride in knowing our students individually and we nurture the students in the kind of music career they wish to achieve. We have connected and connections to Ireland's leading university. Our, we are connected here in the academy with University of Dublin Trinity College. Apply online by the 1st of December and we look forward to seeing you in 2021. I wish you all the best of luck. Hello everybody, um, my name is Finian Collins and I'm a concert pianist and I'm a very proud alumnus of the Royal Irish Academy of Music in Dublin. Um, I studied there for many, many years. Not only was I a student on the BA Bachelor of Arts in Music Performance, but I actually started studying there when I was six. I got an entrance scholarship to study piano with John O'Connor then at that point and I studied violin from the same age. I studied theory there. I studied organ there. I basically spent my entire youth there. I had many, many um, lessons and theory lessons and my siblings all studied there. So it was nearly like a second home. So it really furnished me with a real basis in music education and music appreciation from playing in orchestra, singing in choirs, accompanying, um, working with many different faculties. And so it's very difficult to sort of pinpoint in, in a short a video like this, what actually it meant to me. It meant everything to me. Um, and I was very fortunate that by the time I came to to leave school, that this new degree course, as it was then, had just started. Um, and it was a very special time. We had a very um, enriching time on the BA course. We had a very um, talented class, I think, in that year. We had a um, great sense of bonding and unity and community at the Academy. And of course, world-class teaching um, in particular from John O'Connor, who was, as I say, my teacher right throughout my youth. Um, the Academy is just a, a wonderful, wonderful, inspiring place to study and to play with other people and to get different feedback. And one of the many things that I enjoyed during my time there were masterclasses. I took many, many masterclasses, both offered by the Academy and also offered by outside bodies such as Dublin masterclasses. Hello everyone, um, my name is Fierke Garby. I'm a pianist and alumnus of the Royal Irish Academy of Music. So I first went to the Academy in Dublin when I was, I think, 11. And I studied there all the way through until my BA degree when I was, I think, 22, 23 when I finished. I studied with the wonderful um, Professor Therese Fahey, and she was probably one of the most important teachers um, in my whole musical life and in my formative years. Um, if I could say what I think is one of the most unique aspects of the Academy in Dublin is probably its size. So after I studied at the Academy in Dublin, I went to Paris, the conservatoire there, and to the Academy in London. And they're both huge institutions with masses of numbers of students. But I think the benefit of the Academy was how small it was and how intimate it was and how essentially even in lectures like history, music um, analysis, um, business of music, music technology, very often it was a one-on-one, -on -one. maybe there was four or five people in my class, the biggest class I think I had, maybe there was eight people in it. So it was a very, very bespoke, tailored, one-on-one -on -one experience in all my lectures, which was just incredible. Um, I think it enabled everyone in my class to discover their musical voice very quickly and what uniquely was special about them as opposed to, I think, from my experience of talking to colleagues of mine going to sometimes bigger institutions, 
you know, sometimes you can feel a bit more like a little bee in a massive hive. Um, whereas again, in the Academy in Dublin, I just felt like we all felt very unique um, and we all found our voices, I think, quicker because of that. Um, I always found all the faculty, all the various teachers, professors, staff, um, very accommodating, very welcoming. One thing I would recommend any potential um, student thinking of studying at the Academy in Dublin to do, if, you're, if you do go there, is to not be afraid to approach all the various teachers there. Um, they have a wonderful experienced background. Some of them run festivals, some of them are involved in music technology, some of are very much involved in the business of music on top of all of their other performing activities. And I think not being shy um, and more importantly seeing and um, my experience definitely was of all the professors there, they were always very, very encouraging, very, very helpful any time I went to someone with a, a question on, on some aspect of music or whether it was that I wanted to perform more with singers or whether it's I wanted to play more chamber music or if I wanted to talk to someone who had established a festival or someone who understood, you know, tax for musicians or the business of music. Um, and I think that's one key, key thing I would say was very special and unique about the Royal Irish Academy of Music. Um, since I left the Academy, I've, um, well, I pursue a kind of a varied career. Um, I perform as a soloist, a concerto soloist from time to time. I play a lot of chamber music. I play with singers a lot. Um, and I've also established two festivals, the West Wicklow Festival and Classical Vauxhall. And I really think had I not gone to the Royal Irish Academy of Music, I don't know if I necessarily would have had the confidence to do a lot of those things that I've done since. Um, particularly in realizing what my areas of strength were. Um, and again, like I remember going to Paris um, in my third year of the BA degree in the Royal Irish Academy of Music where I availed of the wonderful Erasmus programme. And I remember explaining my experiences to some of the other musicians there at my age. I think I was maybe 21 and I'd already played multiple concerti with the wonderful orchestras at the Academy in Dublin. Um, I had so many um, performance opportunities and when I compared to where similar people coming from maybe bigger conservatories in various countries all over the world, they hadn't had that level of performing experience. So it's such a unique thing to the Academy in Dublin that if you go there, the opportunities you will get will be far greater, um, I feel, and was my personal experience than if I'd gone maybe to, for my BA degree in a much larger institution. Professor Anthony Bourne is a professor at the Royal Irish Academy of Music. He has taught many third level students. As a performer, he has given many solo recitals. He has pl played concerti with both the RT National Symphony Orchestra and the RT Concert Orchestra. As well as playing in chamber groups, he accompanies singers and instrumentalists. He is here today with one of his third level students and he's going to give a short demonstration lesson. I will now hand you over to Professor Anthony Byrne. Hello, uh, it's lovely to be here. Thank you very much, Colma. Um, I, well, Colma's introduced me. This, I'd like to introduce Dean Kelly. He's one of my uh, diploma level students and he's an extremely fine player. And uh, we're going to work a little bit today on Chopin's Etude in C minor, Opus 25, number 12. Now this etude um, is called the Ocean Etude. It's obviously, you all know it very well. And we've, we've been working on this piece for a while, and we'd like to share with you some of the things we have done to try and solve some of the problems in this uh, very demanding and difficult attitude. So I'd ask, first, if Dean wouldn't mind playing some of it for us, and then we, Dean and I will talk about it. Thank you. Thank you, Dean.
wasn't it? That was uh, really fantastic. Um, I, I, I wonder when you play that piece, you know, I, what I like about Liam's playing is, is that although there's a lot of power and speed, he can play it so much faster and with so much power. But we, we choose not to do that because we want to give the music space, especially if you're playing in a big auditorium. If you play too fast, uh, the music will not travel to the back uh, of the auditorium. So a lot of young players tend to play very fast, but the sound doesn't travel. So we've worked on that. We've also worked on some techniques to try and solve some of the difficulties. Um, we noticed in the score that the rhythm, for example, the, the, there's an accent at the bottom, there's an accent at the top. And often when you hear this piece, you hear accent, 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 and it's a mush in the middle. But it's actually a very clear rhythmic structure to the middle. Isn't that right, Dave? So how did you, well, how did we solve that problem? We practiced with rhythms and we defined a yap at the yap at the yap. Could you show us how we did that? Absolutely. So I'm um, breaking it down into beats of four. I'm yeah. making sure that each semiquaver is completely clear. Yes. Okay. So. Now, you don't want to hear too much of that when you're actually playing the beats because you want the effect of the ocean going from top to bottom. But if that rhythm isn't there, you lose a lot of control. Uh, so uh, probably one of the best recordings to listen to to give you a demonstration of that being done to perfection is uh, a Sokolov. Mm -hmm. So if you go and listen to Sokolov playing it, you'll hear that, that inner rhythm very precisely played, which is very exciting, isn't that right? Absolutely. Now, of course, my favorite version of this is uh, Alfred Corto because he brings out that lower melody. He comes smashing down with his thumb. Now we've worked on that, but we could probably do a bit of more of that, um, especially on that third page where it gets really interesting. So could you show what we're talking about by getting this, this, and all I want to hear really is that wonderful melody coming through with the thumb coming down like that. Just try that, for, you know that part I'm talking about? Yeah, 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 just try a little bit of that now. And I want you to really exaggerate that notion. Now what Corto does is he does that, but he plays the other notes really soft. Can you try that? A little faster, so that we have more sweep. Getting there, that's pretty good. Sometimes I, I like this, uh, to do something which I call the New York flick, because I learned it when I was in New York studying. It's kind of a flick of the wrist, and you flick over, bye, bye. And you know, that flick of the wrist gives you that singing tone like that. Can you just try that with wrist? Now, I don't think they can see your hands, but they can imagine that you're flicking your wrist. <laughs> Go on. performances of this piece, uh, just ones we enjoy, I think we like Sokolov, because Sokolov has everything, right, he really has everything, he has one of, but you can't get away from Corto, yeah. I mean there's wrong notes in it and it's, but my god he just get. I mean the way he plays those mm -hmm. deep notes, those inner notes are so passionate and so much projection, it's so exciting isn't it? So Dean, that was really great. Now, have, you, have I missed anything? Is there anything that you'd like to say that you discovered yourself when you were studying this piece? Um, what, does, what, what do you think about when you're playing this piece yourself? I try not to think too much about uh, yeah. anything really. That's good, yeah. Another thing I like about Dean's playing is that he sits, he's very still at the piano. Does, I remember the great pianist Jonathan Plowright, a very close friend of mine, and he says he could never understand where students were missing notes, but they move so much. Sure. They, they don't have a, a center, so if you're moving all the time, you're introducing the possibility of missing notes. Whereas Dean uh, is uh, something I like to teach, is I like to teach the students to sit still, like the old timers, great pianist Rubenstein, Michelangeli, they all sat, they all sat like stone, with stone face, and they just, and I always feel that the emotion is in the fingertips, it's not in the face, it's in the fingertips. So, Dean, I think that was, uh, did you, I, I, I certainly enjoyed that, Dean, I always love your playing, and uh, thank you so much for thank you. coming today, and uh, thank you very much for listening, and the very best of luck. Virginia Kerr is a prominent Irish soprano who appears frequently in concerto, in concerts, in opera, oratorio, and recitals.
Virginia has sung in Covent Garden, Opera Theatre Company, Opera Ireland, Leipzig Opera, Opera de Nantes and the BBC Proms at the Royal Albert Hall. Virginia is a member of the vocal faculty of the Royal Irish Academy of Music and is a chairperson of the board of directors of Opera Theatre Company. She is the coordinator and lecturer for the performance psychology and wellness at the RIAM. Virginia is a qualified psychotherapist. Hello everybody, my name is Virginia Kerr and I'm a professor of vocal studies at the Royal Irish Academy of Music. Now as well as being a member of the vocal faculty, I am also the coordinator and lecturer for the performance psychology module. You see, in addition to the wonderful musical curriculum that we have at OREAM, we are very committed to the welfare of our students. So we run a six month um, performance psychology module, which takes in stage, you know, stage etiquette, uh, performance anxiety, confidence, everything that you might need as a student to get out onto the stage and give the best performance that you can give and perform to the best of your ability, which is what we at REAM are really very dedicated to you having that opportunity to do that so that all the, the um, structures are put in place for you to give the best of yourself. And also, you know, you'll go away, hopefully, at the end of the lectures, the performance psychology lectures, you'll hopefully go away with a toolbox that you can dip into any time that you need to, in life or in your performing life, in your ordinary everyday life. Um, we also have student support leaders because the welfare of our students is terribly important to us. So you will meet lots of student support leaders who are taken from the student body, but also um, members of the various faculties. So students can go to these support leaders and you know, if, if a student has a problem of any sort, they can go check out with one of the student support leaders, whether it be a student or a teacher, and you know, check in with them, tell them what's happening, and those support leaders will be able to um, either deal with the problem or point you in the direction where you can get help. That's where I come back in again because I am a qualified psychotherapist. So uh, if you feel you needed counselling or therapy, psychotherapy, counselling, you can avail of that. There will be four sessions with me off site at my private practice, which is not far from the academy. and. Uh, that will be funded by the Academy. Four sessions will be funded by the Academy and to hopefully sort out whatever might be troubling you. Also, if you didn't want to go to me as a practicing musician and as a psychotherapist, if you wanted to go to somebody completely outside of the Academy, we also have the same uh, facility, the same um, arrangement with the Clan William Institute, which is again, not very far from the Academy. So that will be four sessions funded by RIAM. If you needed mentoring and help with time management and all sorts of things, just generally with your life and career, um, a member of the WIND faculty, Paul Rowe, uh, will be available to you as well under the same arrangement for sessions funded by the Academy. So we, you know, we have lots of things covered. We're a very small organisation, so we really, really and get to know all our students and um, so therefore we're able to keep an eye, a very close eye on how you're all doing because we want you to have a very happy experience at the Royal Irish Academy. This is a time, you know, it's an exciting time in your life and we want you all, all of you, all the students, all our students that come to the Academy, we want everybody to have a happy experience and it to be um, not only helping you to develop your musical potential but yourselves as people as you go into life and because we're a small unique organization we're unique in that we offer so many um, student support services i think we're the only people in ireland that do a performance psychology module we have mindfulness we have yoga lots of different things 
So we're always keeping an eye so that you can feel very, very secure. So I do hope that you will join us in the um, coming years in the Academy. The deadline for your application is the 1st of December. So enjoy these virtual open days and I hope that I will see lots of you in time in the Royal Irish Academy of Music and that you'll be a member of the Royal Irish Academy of Music family. David Adams is a professor of organ and harpsichord at the Royal Irish Academy of Music. He is a former scholar at the St. Patrick's Cathedral and Trinity College Dublin. David has won many international competitions in Speyer, Lundberg, Dublin and in Bruges. He has performed throughout Ireland and throughout Europe. David is also head of early music and has supported collaborations with wind and string faculties. Davis is a professor of organ and harpsichord. You will now see him giving a lesson to one of his students. instruments as many have called it. That was a famous organ piece by Jean Alain, a French composer who died tragically at the age of 29 in 1940, just killed by a stray bullet in World War II. So here we are talking about history and that is a major part of what the organ is, its history. The first organ was invented around three the third century BC, and it was called a hydralis, and it wasn't primarily built for musical purposes, but to demonstrate the principles of hydraulics. And now we arrive at another major category that organ falls into, and that is science and technology. And organ has been um, leading in science and technology from the very word go until the 18th century, one of the main feats of engineering was the organs of the 18th century, and every city was proud of the construction of its organ in mainland Europe. For at least 700 years we have organ repertoire, so it means that there's an incredible variety of organ literature for the performer to play, dating back at least to the 1400s, and that would cover very famous composers such as Bach or Mendelssohn or Frank, but also composers that are known, known more just to organists like Vidor or Vierne, whose 150th anniversary we're celebrating this year. But you can imagine over 700 years you'd have a huge variety of high quality repertoire to play. So not only is there a huge variety of repertoire, but also in the organ there is a huge variety of sounds. Originally it was all just one sound, like a full orchestra playing fortissimo the whole time, but eventually they worked out um, that it was more artistic if you could divide up this full sound into different smaller sounds. So you can have, um, like in an orchestra, you have the woodwind, the strings and the brass, 
on the organ you have the different families in this case the flutes or the the reeds like the trumpet or the very particular organ sound called the diapasons organ sound. We're here in Dundrum, in Taney Church, so this is a very small organ and very basic. There are not many gadgets on it, but the organs of today um, would have many uh, technological improvements, including the attachment of a computer to the instrument um, and huge number of manuals. The, I think the largest organ is in New Jersey, six manuals and over 300 stops. And you'd have little buttons um, attached to the computer that would control the different sounds of the organ. So you could mix them very, very easily. Um, and that is very important for certain pieces, certain repertoire. But on this organ in Taney, um, you've just got the basics, but you'd be surprised what you can do that with that. There's so much repertoire you can play on this organ. One of the main differences between what a pianist would have to do and what an organist does is the use of the feet. On the piano, very often the right foot would be used for the sustaining pedal. On the organ, there is no sustaining pedal, so it's very important that the hands learn to play with a true legato which is one of the main tasks for the uh, organ student, is to work out how to use fingering in such a way that you have a good legato. The pedals um, on this organ, they go up as far as the F above middle C. So all the notes below that, you can play with the feet, you can play quite virtuosic pieces, but mostly you are playing the bass notes of the texture. So it can be difficult for a pianist coming to the organ because the left hand is fighting with the feet trying to play the bass line. And that can be a stage in an organist's learning uh, curve that is quite tricky. It's almost like learning a bicycle. Once you can do it, you can do it. But it can be painful um, to learn how to do that. I'm going to play you... Sorry, I lost my sheets there. I'm going to play you a little first of a piece by Buxtehude, who was in the generation before Bach. In fact, Bach went to hear him, met him, and even, I think, applied for his job. But the job entailed marrying one of his daughters, so he declined. It would have been composed for an organ something like this. This is the, um, the organ in Harlem, where I actually played my final exam when I studied in Amsterdam. And it's a particular type of organ which has the organ split into different sections. These are the pedal towers here on the left and right. So when you play a pedal solo, you would hear it in stereo, stereophonic effect um, going from left to right. Like in this next pedal solo. And you can just imagine in the, 17th, the end of the 17th century what this would have been like for the visitor to Lübeck on market day. When you go in and hear this incredible piece played on an incredible organ. Um, here we go, the pedal solo.
So I hope you enjoyed this short presentation on the king of instruments, the organ. Thank you for listening. So that was a piece from the Fitzwilliam Virginal book, which is an extraordinary collection of virginal pieces, or harpsichord pieces, composed at the end of the 16th century, beginning of the 17th century, and collected by an extraordinary man, I think his name was Francis Treyen, and he was in prison for a good number of years, and he collected these manuscripts while he was in prison and copied them out, and it's an incredible um, collection of about a thousand pages of music. It comes in two volumes. Um, if you're a piano player, a pianist, you may have noticed that I was using early music fingering. So instead of a, playing a scale like the normal way, with um, thumb under, um, going one, two, three, then thumb under, one, two, three, four, five, the way they did it in all countries. Spain, Italy, France, England, Germany, over a period of, say, um, to at least 200 years, 1500s, 1600s, 1700s, nearly 300 years, I think, um, they used paired fingerings. Analogous in the string players would be down up bows, and in the wind players, when they used to speak in syllables into their instruments to make them go heavy light, heavy light. Um, a little bit like dooby dooby doo in the jazz world. So um, if I play some semi quavers here with paired fingering, you can hear that that it's this slight um, little life within the semi quavers, so they're not just in incredibly the same. So that's one of the features of early music is that we have different fingerings that make different effects in the music. And I will show you briefly how the harpsichord works. It's very, very simple. You have a thing called the jack rail. This is the jack rail. And if I take that off, um, you'll see all the jacks underneath. The main reason for the rail is to stop them flying out like that, or to stop them sticking up and not going back down. So um, and the jacks are just a bit of wood and at the top of the piece of wood is a plectrum and a damper. So when I press a key down, the jack simply goes up and plucks the string. Very, very simple mechanism. Here there are two sets of strings at the top and this, um, each note plucks to the left and to the right. So this one plucks to the right and this one plucks to the left but it's the same note. And then the difference is that this one is nearer the bridge, so it makes a slightly, slightly more nasal sound. Sorry, I'll just separate them out. 
That's the, fl the less nasal one, the fluty one. And this is the more nasal one. And you can join them together with the coupling mechanism that's here. You just push the, push the manuals together and then you'll see that the two of them are sounding. Underneath, there's another set of strings. This is called the eight foot bridge. And that's for the, the two main ones that I've already been talking about. But underneath, there's a four foot bridge. And the strings attached to that play an octave higher. Um, so can I find that? So you can hear them, um, that it's there now. It's not in tune, so it's easy to hear. Um, so, very, very simple. And a lot of the music that is now played on the piano, before about 1750, like Bach, Handel, Handel, Scarlatti, that would have all been played on an instrument like this. All the partitas and the French suites, the English suites of Bach, all the Scarlatti sonatas would have been designed for an instrument something like this. Um, and it is actually so much more exciting with apologies to piano players, pianists. Um, if you play a, a chord down here, you'll hear what I mean. Got real excitement and bite. If you play that same chord on a piano, it will sound rather dull by comparison. Um, and especially in harpsichord music, Scarlatti sonatas, you often find low down chords there that are so exciting on the harpsichord. Apart from playing literature, the harpsichord was very, very commonly used as an accompanying instrument. And in the 18th century, no orchestra could function without its harpsichordist. Um, the harpsichord was used for a variety of things. Um, it, it held the orchestra together. Very often the um, music was led by the, the Kapellmeister or whoever played the harpsichord. Um, but in opera, it was very, very important for the singers. In recitative, for example, it kept them in tune as well. Um, and it was a very flexible instrument to um, follow the singers. You often would it, um, play it from a short hand. So the, the player would often just get a bass line like this and you would make up the chords. That would be your entire part and you would be expected to make up the, um, the part, something like this. Academy in Dublin, of course, we teach figured bass and keyboard harmony to our students. Um, and the ultimate aim is to make a nice accompaniment that you can use for a company. This is a typical piece. Um, it's actually by Handel from his opera Julius Caesar. And you can see sometimes then he has writes little figures so that you can um, know which chords to play. the harpsichordist is the cello line. And you're expected to fill in, however. So the harpsichord also has the function of filling in the middle of a texture between bottom and top in many of these Baroque works. But because paper was so scarce and composers were composing so fast, it was very useful to have this shorthand for the keyboard players. Um, that is all I want to say for now about Harp's Court. So hopefully it will have piqued your interest and I'm sure you'd be welcome in the Academy to come and play the Harp's Court at some point. Thank you very much.
The Lucienne Amora Tessier Scholarship is open to all Irish piano students at the Academy. Brendan Kennedy. I am 23 years old and I am a pianist from Dublin, Ireland. Hello everyone, my name is Dina Contria. I'm 17 years old and have been a student of Raymond Curie for over 10 years now here at the Royal Irish Academy of Music. Hi, my name is Ralph Ryers. I've just turned 18 and I study under Raymond Curie at the Royal Irish Academy of Music. Originally from Suchava, a small town in the north of Romania, um, but I live in Dublin and I'm in sixth year in Sanford Park School. I live in Northern Ireland and I'm in my last year of grammar school at Sullivan Upper in Hollywood, County Down. I recently completed my Masters in Music Performance at the Royal Irish Academy of Music, studying with Lance Coburn, and currently I am continuing my studies with him on the Professional Mentorship Programme. It is my dream to win the Lucian and Maura Tessier Scholarship, as this would make a huge difference to my continued career in music. I would like to study for my Bachelor of Music Performance degree at the Royal Irish Academy of Music. Hello, I'm Raymond Keery, Raul Friar's piano teacher. Uh, Raul has been with me now for a number of years. He came to me via, uh, in fact, a, a local centre examiner who spotted him uh, in his uh, examining travels and recommended him to me and uh, of course I was delighted to take him on. Raul is a, a wonderful pianist and he's uh, progressed so much over the years and won many prizes. He's going to play The Lark by Balakirov. This is an arrangement of uh, the song The Lark by uh, Glinka and then he's going to finish with uh, the second ballad by Franz Liszt. So please welcome Raul Friars.
Hello, my name is Lance Coburn. I'm a piano teacher in the Royal Irish Academy of Music. And I'd just like to say a few words about uh, my student, Brendan Kennedy, uh, who I've been teaching for the last five years. Uh, he is going to perform in the Lucian and Maura Tessier Scholarship, which uh, I must say is a wonderful opportunity for young pianists studying in the Academy and to have that uh, uh, opportunity to uh, have funding to support their uh, careers in the future. Um Hello, my name is Raymond Keery. I'm Dita Condria's piano teacher. Uh, Dita began with me 10 years ago. Hard to believe she walked into my room as a total beginner. And uh, with so many successes since then, she now finds herself here competing for this wonderful scholarship. 
um, playing some of the most challenging repertoire. She's going to start with uh, a beautiful atmospheric piece by Sibelius, uh, Impromptu, Opus 5, number 5. And then she's going to finish with uh, two movements from Chopin's third piano sonata, the B minor sonata. She will play the first and the final movement. So please uh, welcome Dida Condria.
don't forget to apply before the 1st of December. Fill an application form, provide a repertoire list of previously performed works, provide a detailed CV, including performances, exams, and course taken to date. I really encourage each other international students to come here to the Academy to study because I think it's a very good place to study music and in my opinion it can be considered one of the greatest places in Europe to study music. And one thing I like from the Academy is that we get two hours a week of piano lessons or instrument lessons, which I think is the only place in Europe we have this. In Dublin, I love this course because it's so broad and there's none other like it in the country and there's so many performance opportunities for me. I study at the Academy because they teach you to play with great style and finesse. Thank <laughs> you.